All right, we're going to be at John chapter 1. <clears throat> uh, you ask a conservative, was Jesus divine? And they're going to say, yes. And you ask a liberal, was Jesus a man? And most of them are going to say, yes. The problem is, neither one of them are, are quite right, because Jesus was both. He was God, and he was man. Um, fully God and fully man, um, fully divine. He was both. And that's what we're looking at tonight in our, in our study. John chapter 1, beginning in verse 14. Someone read verses 14 through 18 for me, please. All right, thank you. Um, many Christians do a lot of complaining about Christmas. Um, it's too commercial, they say. It has pagan origins. We've got to put Christ back into Christmas. Um, the only thing they haven't said is bah humbug. Yes, Christmas has become very commercial, but as we purchase and wrap gifts, Every present can be a silent testimony to the supreme gift, God's only begotten Son. Yes, we know Santa is a myth and that reindeer don't fly, it's pure fiction. But instead of griping about these non-essentials, which only focuses on them, we need to call attention to the truth of the baby who was born in Bethlehem. And what about the cry to put Christ back into Christmas? Well, the truth is he never left. Um, I'm reminded of uh, a meme I saw last night. Um, it was uh, a picture of, of Jesus uh, standing there at the rally. Rem remember uh, Kamala Harris's rally where the two men stood up and they said a couple things and then they said, Jesus is Lord. And she said, I think you need to go to the smaller rally down the street. Uh, uh, well, the meme, the meme I saw, it was Jesus standing in that rally. said, silly woman, I'm everywhere. Not just the rally down the street. I'm here at this rally as well. Um, um, put Christ back into Christmas. I understand the sentiment. We've, they've done a lot to try to get Christ out of Christmas. I remember uh, a number of years ago, not too long after we started 4-H, um, someone had suggested an idea to me, and I, and I was thinking about going around and getting businesses to um, purchase and decorate a tree, and then we put them on display at Christmas in the country, and we have the people coming through judge the trees, which one's first, which one's second, which one's third. We give these businesses... Um, a trophy or an award for their business um, um, coming in those positions. And then we give the trees to needy families. Well, I didn't get around to promoting it, but we did end up getting a tree that we ended up giving away. Um, the 4-H club worked on this. And I still remember talking to the county 4-H agent at the time. We're going to have to call them holiday trees. We can't call them Christmas trees. I'm like, are you kidding me i people are trying to get christ down to christmas but the thing is he never left and he's never going to leave um i understand the sentiment put christ back into christmas but he let, never left listen to the words of the carols heard over and over again in the stores and the malls and on the streets they proclaim more truth in one holiday than many pulpits do in three months. 
They put into the minds of young and old the wonderful truth that the Lord is come and he is now adored. Christmas is not humbug. It's a season of opportunity to point others to the Savior. It gives us a chance to say to friends and loved ones, do you know the real meaning of the season? I do because I believe in Christ. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king, peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. What a glorious time is Christmas. When we think about the great gift that God gave us and the reason that he sent them so that God and man could be reconciled. We've had some people complain about Christmas in the country, saying that there's too much emphasis on Santa and lights and all of that. I, Well-meaning folks, I have no doubt. But my friend, all of that gives us the opportunity to share the truth in the back portion of the hayride. We have Santa. But before the kids can get to Santa, they have to go by Ms. Eileen, where she tells them the Christmas story with an emphasis on what Christmas is really all about. Um, do you know the real meaning of Christmas? I do, because I know Christ. Um, here, in John chapter 1, verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, save your places and turn over with me, please, to Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18. Someone read verse 18 through 23 for me, please. This is how Jesus, the Messiah, was born. His mother, Mary, was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Ghost. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, Joseph, son of David, the angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin, will, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Emmanuel means God with us. And that's what John is telling us here in John chapter 1, verse 14. That the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. How exciting is it to realize that God came to live with us? Um, verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Herbert Armstrong, some of y'all may be familiar with him, the founder of the Worldwide Church of God. He said, look, the phrase, the Word became flesh, or he took the phrase, the Word became flesh, and concluded that it meant God was, uh, God the Son was converted into flesh, and so that Jesus was all man. He was no longer God, and so that's what he taught within his church. Christ the Word did not merely assume an additional human nature. Rather, he experienced metamorphosis into human flesh. He became exclusively human. That is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that Jesus, after his incarnation, was, I think you have some blanks here, was fully God and fully man. 
He was fully God and fully man. But while on earth, Jesus limited himself. Jesus limited himself. Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Someone read that for me, please. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one of spirit and one of mind. Do not out of selfish ambition or being conceived. Rather, in humility, value what is above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the other. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus, that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Jesus emptied himself. Jesus emptied himself. Himself. That's what this passage is saying here. That Jesus emptied. I'm sorry. Kenosis. Yes, sir. That's that's what this passage is referred to as the kenosis passage. Um, it is Jesus emptying himself, limiting himself, um, so that he could um, take on the form of a man while he was here on earth. It, it's beyond my comprehension um, how Jesus was able to pack all of that. Um, um, how many of y'all seen um, the the uh, cartoon version of Aladdin? And you remember um, at the end when the bad guy he ends up becoming a genie and he sucked into the lamp and says, all this power and little teeny living space. That's what Jesus did. He took all of, all of the godness of him and compressed it and compacted it within the form of a man. Oh, don't you, don't you know, uh, The disciples around him, every once in a while, they could just see some of that Shekinah glory of God easing out of him. Ooh, oozing out of him. Yes, the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, went up there and the, the Shekinah glory of God is demonstrated or displayed in Jesus himself. He said, I just can't hold it back no more. And the, all of that glory of God demonstrated um, right there on top of the mountain. All of that uh, placed within the form of a man. Now, look there again. John chapter 1 and verse 14. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now that word translated as dwelt um, basically means he um, tented or he tabernacled among us. In other words, he took uh, he he took his godness and he put it within um, a, a, a form, a tent. You know how Paul talks about um, I'm gonna lay aside this tent. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's what Jesus did. He came to Earth and he put on the tent. Um, remember in the Old Testament. Um, after they've been to uh, Mount Sinai, God commands them to build a tabernacle. And the unique thing about the tabernacle was, God said, this is where I'm going to put my name. And it was a place where God met man. And then later on, and, and, and that was portable. And then later on, Solomon built the temple. 
And God said, this is going to be the place where I put my name. And the Bible says that the Shekinah glory, the glory of God, the majesty of God fell upon the temple. And the light was so bright that they could not look upon it. It was, it, it was blinding. Um, that's what is the, the same word um, is referring to what Jesus did. He tabernacled uh, uh, here on earth. He, just as you had first the tabernacle and the temple where God and man met, then finally you have Jesus Christ where God and man are one. And people are actually able to see and interact with God through Jesus Christ. Because Christ has come and one of the things I'm glad this is pointed out or reminded me of sometimes. Um, you, you're at church and the little children, they want to come up and talk to you. And uh, you can talk to them looking down on them, but you interact with them a whole lot more when you get down on their level. And you're able to look them eye, look, look them eye, and eye, eye to eye and talk to them on their level. That's what God did when Jesus Christ was incarnated. He came down and looked us in the eye. And he said, now you can interact with me. Uh, when he was crucified, the veil was torn in the temple. And there was no longer a separation between God and man. Because God, through Jesus Christ, came to earth to be on our level so that he could communicate with us. Uh, Jesus came and uh, lived a sinless life because we could not. The Bible says he took upon him our sin, but says they also gave us his righteousness. A lot of things Jesus did in his time here on earth and his crucifixion and such. But one of the things he did was demonstrate how much God loved us, that he was willing to compact all of this stuff and limit himself. Can you imagine... Um, allowing yourself to be hungry when you don't have to be. Allowing yourself to be sick when you don't have to be. Allowing yourself to be tired and sleepless, to be homeless, to be weary when you don't have... Who in their right mind would do that on purpose? And yet Jesus did to be here with us. I, um... I, I can't imagine John when he's writing this. Um, what must uh, overcome him? Can you imagine when God's telling the angels what he's about to do? And the angels are like, you're going to do what? And, and Jesus is going to do what? It had to be beyond their understanding. Because this is the creator of everything. And they're like, you're going to go down there and be one of them? Why in the world would you do that? And yet that's what John is telling us Jesus did. I, he came down here and he tabernacled among us. Took all of that godness and put it in the form of a man to be here with us because he loved us. Now, notice if you will, um, uh, verse 14 again. I don't know what's happening, but... I mean, other than the fact that I talk too much tonight, but I get to I get to working on this. I, we're we're doing like a verse at a time. I don't normally do that, but but look at it again, if you will, verse fourteen. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed His glory, the glory as the one and only Son from the Father, full of what? Grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. Is that the last two blanks? Yes. Grace and truth? Yes. In his book, Great, The Grace and Truth Paradox, Randy Alcombe writes, Truth without grace breeds a self-righteous legalism that poisons the church and pushes the world away from Christ. Grace without truth breeds moral indifference and keeps people from seeing their need for Christ. Attempts to soften the gospel by minimizing truth 
keeps people from Jesus. Attempts to toughen the gospel by minimizing grace keeps people from Jesus. It's not enough for us to offer grace or truth. We must offer both. And that grace is available to everyone. I was listening to the radio today, um, and uh, I'm trying to, I think it was uh, Alcom in his book, uh, he was being quoted. He said, there was a notorious murder that took place in the area where he grew up. And um, um, a father had killed his, had abused and then killed his three sons. And uh, he was arrested and put in prison. And um, um, it came to the time of his execution. And he said, at the breakfast table that morning, the man was supposed to be executed that night. At the breakfast table that morning, his daughters prayed that this man on death row would know the truth and profess Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And he said, I'm the dad. I know that's what I'm supposed to do. So I said amen to their prayer. But that is not what I was thinking. I was thinking he was deserving what he's getting. And said that night at the execution, the witnesses and the, new, the reporter people that were in there um, witnessing the execution they all came out saying that this man on his last words as he's about to be executed said i have never known peace but i have accepted jesus christ as my lord and savior i have asked him to forgive me and for the first time in my life I know peace. Death Row abused and killed his three children, three sons. And on Death Row, or leading up to Death Row, he became a follower of Jesus Christ and asked God to forgive him. And our natural inclination is he doesn't deserve it. But the truth, but the truth of the matter is, none of us do. And and if God and if God's grace is not good enough for him, then it's not good enough for me. We have to share. Uh, we have to tell people about God's grace, but we also have to tell them the truth. When Jesus confronted the the woman called in adultery, he said. Who accuses you? She said, nobody. He said, neither do I. Grace. And then he tells her, go and sin no more. Truth. The woman at the well. And Jesus said, go and call your husband. She says, I have no husband. He said, I know. You've had five husbands. And the one you live with now is not your husband. Truth. But then she goes and tells all the people about this Messiah that she has found. One that loved her in spite of what the town people are saying about her. Grace. Wasn't she a Samaritan? Yeah. Grace and truth always go hand in hand. One will not work without the other. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your grace. And Lord, help us to be gracious as well. But help us to share the truth that all apart from Jesus Christ are lost and hell bound. But Lord, help us to do it in a gracious way. As one beggar telling another beggar where to find food. Help us to represent you well. And Jesus, as we are entering into the Christmas season, Help us to remember what a great gift it is that you provided for us. And Lord, help us to faithfully share that gift with others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Can you can you picture John writing this and just shaking his head and wonder how in the world did God do this? Why in the world did God do this? I'm glad you came. I hope you are too. <laughs>